Is Ken Martin from Ohio still in the room? You left your receipt in the elevator on the way down. Oh. <laughs> you might need that one, yes. I just would like to give one big round of applause for our friends at the Idaho chapter for the great conference all week. <laughs> Wonderful speakers, great presentations, great posters, good chances to visit with our coworkers around the nation. It's been a great conference. We are going to have another wonderful speaker today, Dr. Wadid Cruzado, excuse me, from Montana State University, the president of Montana State University since 2010, going on six years. Um, busy lady, she's wonderful. Having grown up in Montana, we have a big rivalry in my family about the ducks, or not the ducks, that's my current family. My childhood family was, you know, the bobcats and the grizz, but I am a Bobcat fan, so I'm happy to have her here today. She is the 12th president of Montana State University, an institute recognized as a Carnegie Foundation, and one of the 108 universities that for its very high research activity. Great university to go to. Dr. Cruzado has significantly reshaped the face and the future of Montana's first land-grant institution. She has developed many innovative academic programs, most notably in my mind is the one with Washington State University, their cooperative veterinary program. I know many of our 4-H members from Oregon have participated in that. They also have a medical education consortium program in collaboration with the University of Washington. And that just shows what a wonderful collaborator and partner Dr. Cruzado is. Um, for those of us Bobcat fans in the room, they have undertaken a 10 million renovation of the Bobcat Stadium and that's been exciting and they accomplished it in 10 months, which is unheard of. They also have just recently received um, over $75 million in donations to um, their business and interpret business constructing a lab and the innovative sensor for the Engineering College of Engineering. Lots of great things are happening at Montana State University. Dr. Cruzado has received many awards and honors, but we're most happy to have her here to tell us who needs extension anyway. Dr. Cruzado. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Much better. Thank you so much, Shana, for your kind introduction. And thank you, members of the Epsilon Sigma Phi, for your invitation to join you today. What an honor for me to be here. I want to thank the organizers of this conference for the privilege of spending some time with you this morning before you travel safely back home. I wanted to be here with you because first, I want to thank you for your dedicated service to Extension, a truly a jewel of a program in the history of our nation. I also wanted to be here because we have much in common in our mutual commitment to the Extension system throughout the country and a deep respect for Extension professionals and their important work. And thirdly, we share a particularly colorful figure in early extension history in M.L. Wilson, often recognized as the first extension agent in Montana. Wilson was told by Montana State Professor Fred S. Cooley, the first extension director, that, quote, your office will be chiefly under your hat. And it was. <laughs> Wilson spent most of his time with the people in the fields and homes and town hall buildings, a visionary who would rise quickly up the ranks of the organization and, as many of you in this room know, on January 10, 1927, M.L. Wilson helped establish Epsilon Sigma Phi in Bozeman, Montana. So this fact makes me feel <laughs> As Shanna said, I have been blessed with the opportunity to serve Montana State University 
for the almost six years now. It's, it's hard to believe. And actually, we always say that it's the first land-grant university because we are blessed with not only the first land-grant act, but actually the third land-grant act. In 1994, we also have some very special ties because that third act of Congress was chaired, the initiative was chaired by the president of Montana State University at the time, Michael Malone. And thanks to that, not only we had this wonderful third land grant act embracing our tribal communities, in the case of Montana in specific, it embraced all seven tribal colleges. So we have eight uh, land grant institutions in the state of Montana. It's the largest number of any state in the union. So I feel very, very proud of that. when I first arrived to Montana. And for those of you who are visiting us for the first time in this part of the country, how many of you are first, uh, first time here? Idaho, Montana, excellent. Well, that was my situation six years ago, and I immediately, immediately fell in love with the people of Montana. Actually, I remember early on um, riding in the car with the chair of the Board of Regents, who was a retired uh, attorney you know, a very seasoned veteran, kind of stern, kind of individual. So I was just exuding enthusiasm about the things that I was learning about the people from Montana. And I was saying something like, Steve, uh, people here, they love history. They are incredible storytellers. They are authentic. What you see is what you get. They are so friendly. And he just kept driving away and he looked at me and he said, we're lonely. <laughs> well, if, it is, if until now you have not detected an accent, if you detect an accent, well, it's the mic. <laughs> so I would like to share with you some autobiographical information to put my remarks in context. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. That's where the accent comes from. I was born and raised actually in the western city that is home to the only land-grant university in the Caribbean, the University of Puerto Rico at Mayagüez, which is also the only land-grant university in a Spanish-speaking country. Speaking about meeting in places with sand and sun, since I cannot join you in New Jersey, consider going to Puerto Rico in one of your meetings. <laughs> <laughs> like many of you, growing up, uh, I had deep roots in the soil. My grandparents were farmers, my stepfather was a coffee merchant, and my mother was a homemaker, endowed with intelligence and drive. And perhaps like some of you, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. By a show of hands, how many of you are first generation students? Excellent. So the question is, what made it possible for me to explore this academic life path? And the answer is simple. It was not additional intelligence than what my parents had. Um, the, difference, the only difference between my parents and I actually is very simple. Someone gave me an opportunity. That was it. I was given an opportunity to go to college, and based on that experience, I'm determined to ensure that no other young man or woman, like my father or my mother, is ever deprived of the wonders of a college education, because I know that education truly transforms lives. In my case, education enabled me to initiate my career in my native Puerto Rico, in the same institution where it all started for me. It made it possible to work at another fine land university when I moved from the island of enchantment, Puerto Rico, to the land of enchantment, <laughs> New Mexico. I was convinced I was crossing the twilight zone. <laughs> and most recently, it allowed me to live in the majestic state of Montana serving the first land grant university of the state. Actually, upon learning about my appointment, a good friend who is a geologist immediately texted me 
and said, why is it that you only get to work in the most spectacular places on the face of the earth? <laughs> to give you a sense of perspective, my native Puerto Rico has a total area of 35 square miles, 3,500 3, square miles. It could fit into the state of Montana about 42 times. <laughs> Keep in mind, however, there are about 3.5 million people living in Puerto Rico, and one million in the fourth largest state of the world. So, I have known the densely and the sparsely populated, the tropics and the desert, some climate extremes in different latitudes, and then the invigorating weather of Montana. <laughs> tell you the story that as the president of the largest institution of higher education in the big sky state, not that rivalry is important, <laughs> I'm frequently honored with opportunities to speak at events such like this. And a few years ago I was invited to serve as the keynote speaker at an eighth grade graduation ceremony in a rural community outside of Bozeman. The occasion required a combination of three rural schools to reach the celebratory quorum for the happy graduates, all 11 of them. <laughs> At the end of the ceremony, while enjoying ice cream with members of the class and their families, a second grader approached me. Here he was, with his wild blonde hair, wearing long pants that were already too short for him. And when the time came for me to bid farewell, this farm boy, still enjoying his cup of ice cream, looked up with the brightest blue eyes you have ever seen and said to me, I hope you have a wonderful life. Isn't that wonderful? And I think we can say that thanks to our land-grant education and the work of the Extension Service, we have had a wonderful life. Providing a good life for all Americans must have been on President Lincoln's mind when he signed the Morrill Act more than 150 years ago. With that signature, President Lincoln changed millions of lives including many people in this room. By a show of hands again, how many of you graduated from the land grant institution? There you go. So think about it. On July the 2nd, 1862, President Lincoln signed the Morrill Act, establishing one of the most revolutionary ideas, that we were going to found one public university in each state and territory of the Union for the purpose of educating the sons and daughters of the working families of America. That is truly a revolutionary notion. And it happened in the middle of the Civil War. In the midst of the Civil War, the people's representatives actually were hard at work. In fact, the year of 1862, Congress the U.S. Congress produced several pieces of legislation that would have had an enormous impact on the country, and particularly for those of us who live in the West. In, the, in, that, same, in that year, the Federal Department of Agriculture was established in the month of May. In the same month that saw the passage of the Homestead Act, Congress approved the Pacific Railroad Act on July the 1st, 1862 just one day before lawmakers approved the Moral Act. So the way I think about this is that the Homestead Act and the Railroad Act would provide us with geographical and horizontal mobility. But it was the Land Grant Act that gave us the vertical and the social mobility that have strengthened American democracy in an everlasting manner. And what a wonderful lesson for all of us that rather than being constrained by the difficult circumstances of their time, those elected officials chose to envision a better and brighter future by arming the common people with access to higher education. And what about extension? How was it 
that this nation rich in natural resources and vast in land came to design a system that reached to each corner of its territory with access to education and service. Well, the man whose work inspired extension as a distinctive and, I would add, an indispensable trait of land-grant universities and whose hands-on outreach is now replicated around the globe is Seaman A. Knapp. During his life, Seaman Knapp was recognized for innovations that changed the course of history in America. He was born Seaman Asahel Knapp in northern New, uh, New York on 1833. He grew up working on the family farm and attended a one-room school where his schoolmaster lit the fire of knowledge and curiosity. College was, of course, the next logical step, but Seaman's father and his brother Alonzo opposed his plan. It is too expensive, said his father, tuition equal to a year worth of the family's income. Besides, added Alonso, it would mean, quote, the spoiling of a fine cabinet maker to make a poor scholar. <laughs> but Seaman's mother understood his passion for learning, and secretly, she encouraged her son to pursue his dream. And his sister Mary ultimately sacrificed the contents of her hope chest so that her brother could go to college. Seaman Knapp graduated from Union College and in time would become president of Iowa State College. Later in life, he was instrumental in the passage of the Hatch Act. With its approval in 1887, agricultural experiment stations were established at land-grant universities across the country. The U.S. became the first nation in the world to establish such a cohesive system in which teaching and research nourish each other. I don't know if you know, if you were aware, that Seaman Knapp was instrumental in the passage of the Hatch Act. Perhaps Seaman Knapp is better known for rescuing the cotton industry in the South from the boll weevil. When we take a closer look at his role, an interesting fact comes to the surface. And here it is. Through research, the U.S. Department of Agriculture had already developed a plan to control the past by accelerating the point of maturity of the cotton plant. The department had disseminated the results through reports and, and pamphlets, but growers were skeptical. Farmers then, and as you know well, even farmers now, did not believe in book farming, right? So Seaman Knapp was appointed a special agent for the promotion of agriculture in the South with the specific charge to take the plant directly to cotton growers. Let me insist on this point. It was clear that a solution to the pest problem had been identified. But implementation of the proposed plan necessitated something more than just science. In order to create the desired change, the plan needed a person who would earn the good faith of growers and businessmen alike. It needed someone who could provide objective and relevant information who could show farmers how to replicate the proposed solution and in the process build a trusting relationship for the future. In other words, the plan was languishing because it needed an intermediary who would bridge geographical and cultural differences. It was then that the figure of the extension agent was born. The farmer said uh, Nap quote, must solve his prob this problem on his own farm and with his own hands. What a man hears, he may doubt. What he sees, he may possibly doubt. But what he does himself, he cannot doubt. At his urging, President Theodore Roosevelt appointed the Commission on Country Life, which court, which recommended the addition of, quote, the third coordinated branch of extension work to complete the branches of teaching and research in land-grant universities. The language included in this recommendation deserves to be quoted in its entirety. 
quote, each state college of agriculture should be empowered to organize as soon as practicable a complete department of college extension so managed as to reach every person on the land in its state with both information and inspiration. Okay. The rest, as they say, is history. The pathway to the Smith-Lever Act had been carved out, championed by Congressman Asbury F. Lever of South Carolina and Senator Hoke Smith of Georgia. In 1914, Congress approved the bill that gave life to the cooperative extension system. On the occasion of its signage, President Woodrow Wilson described it in a powerful manner. He said, quote, next to the Federal Reserve Act, this is our greatest contribution to the national welfare. Impressive. Yet, it is undeniable today that despite the devotion, the best efforts, and the incredible accomplishments of thousands of extension agents documented in every corner of our country, extension has faced and continues to confront many challenges. Some of them, like those associated with budget constraints, are nothing new, are they, right? However, some of the circumstances extension faces today are unprecedented. Challenges such as changes in demographics with the aging and diversification of a critical population served by extension, different agricultural patterns with larger corporations and fewer independent farmers who are an important base for extension, or increasing difficulty recruiting young agents who often find a more lucrative career elsewhere, or finally an overwhelming amount of information must mostly free and readily available on computers elsewhere or everywhere. But as I always say, people don't know Mr. Google. Mr. Google doesn't go to baptisms or funerals, right, like our extension people do. Now, some dedicated agents and users fear once again that the best days of extension have come and gone. We've been here before. I know that many of us have had an interesting, more than one interesting conversation with those unfamiliar with extension and even with some elected officials who question the value of extension today. And this is the purpose of this wonderful organization. And this is the reason why land-grant universities need to be vigilant. So here are some of the statements that are commonly heard, or that I have commonly heard. Let me see if you have heard them too. The first one, I had no idea that extension was part of your university, right? Many people are surprised to learn that extension was designed to complete and complement the educational mission of land-grant universities. Extension was conceived as the vehicle that would transmit the research conducted in the labs and in the fields, the lessons that were taught in the classrooms to those individuals who were not residents of the land-grant universities. This third branch of our tripartite mission has an unbreakable bond with land-grant institutions. The founding commission described it as an indispensable condition, quote, without which no college of agriculture can adequately serve its state. It is to the extension department of these colleges, if properly conducted, that we must now look for the most effective rousing of the people of the land. That's a quote. Because of extension and the nature of, the, of its geographical presence, we can rightfully assert that our entire state is our campus. Extension is the component that enables land-grant universities to break away from the isolation of the ivory tower. It builds bridges and connects us to our communities in a meaningful way. That's why land-grant universities are different. Looking towards the future, we at ESP and land-grant universities then should be asking, 
even tougher questions of ourselves, such as, okay, so if extension programs are partner in our scholarly endeavors, if they are one crucial element in our three-dimensional mission, do we hold the extension initiatives in the same level of esteem as our academic and research endeavors? Do we value them and reward them in a manner that is consistent with our aspirations as engaged land-grant universities? A second statement I frequently hear is, I like extension programs, but I'm not willing to pay for them. Have you heard that? Okay, so the word cooperative, as in cooperative extension, is in the name for a very good reason. It denotes a funding model that goes back to the manner in which Seaman Knapp first supported his demonstration work. In order to make things happen, the passionate and impatient Knapp access funds from private and public sources. The Smith-Lieber Act preserves this mechanism for different sources of funding, adding matching requirements. The legislation describes extension, quote, as a cooperative venture among federal, state, local, and individual funding support, a system of adult and youth education that has become a model for the rest of the world, end of quote. Looking towards the future, then, we should ask, where in our funding priorities is extension. If our budgets are a reflection of our values, how do we, or even do we, help make its case not only at the county, state, and federal levels, but also at our own institutions? Next time someone asks extension to embrace one more great project, are we ready to apportion an adequate level of funding to make it happen? A third common assertion I hear is, extension programs are dated. We are not an agricultural society anymore. A hundred years ago, when extension was founded, one third of our nation's population was involved in agriculture. Today, about 1% of our population feeds our entire nation. But this is a very important 1%. This 1% includes hundreds of thousands of individuals who today use and need the products, programs, and services provided by extension throughout its history. American families in this segment of the population still find immense value in 4-H, in the responsiveness of extension local advisory boards in the empowerment that results from our community development efforts and in our agricultural and natural resources programs. The farmer boy I met at that graduation belongs to this group. He, his family, and hundreds of thousands like him around the nation look up to our programs as a source of stability for the present, for the present and hope for the future. Thanks to the advancements of the agricultural research that is conducted in our universities and our, our, our experimental stations, we have increased productivity and quality in food, fiber, and fuel like never before. At the same time, we have protected pricing structures and ensured that farmers and ranchers will receive a profitable return on their investment and enjoy, as Seaman Neb envisioned, a more satisfying and comfor comfortable quality of life. It is important, however, for us to be vigilant, more vigilant than ever, and to strive for reasonable agility. The promise of our future in extension will depend largely on how will we continue to adapt to our new realities. Several extension programs have already implemented urban projects in which a strong interest in agriculture is having a transformative effect. We were hearing about some of those in the poster session. The local food movement and a new widespread interest in urban gardening are making a difference in the nutrition, health, and well-being of these communities. In essence, the local food grassroots movement is a perfect collaborator for which extension is, just as we were called to be, a source of inspiration. Some of the questions for our future then are, 
how can we help Extension continue to strengthen its agricultural programs? How can we better market the exciting programs that have provided legitimacy to Extension among the agricultural producers of the nation and the world? How do we tell our story in a way that honors our traditions and our history and integrates the new voices of society today? How do we expand our circle and bridge differences so that we include the values and the assets of the traditional rural landscapes as well as of those of the urgent urban, urban realities? This brings up another challenge we frequently hear. It looks like extension is losing its mission. Really? The agricultural and natural resources programs were the first base of support of extension, followed by programs in youth development, so like 4 like H, as well as programs in family and consumer science and community development. Extension excels in providing, providing educational and service programs that have relevancy for people from different backgrounds, ages, and socioeconomic status. However, at some times and in some places, some more socially or service-oriented programs have been considered by some as deviations from Extension's intended mission. Classifications, big thick as walls have been erected to try to separate the traditionalist or ruralist, those who advocate for the original agricultural programs, and the expansionist or urbanites, those who provide service in community development programs. My friends, to me, this exercise provides little more than a divisionary nomenclature and a false distinction between service and education. For people who are in need, all our programs are needed. Agricultural education, youth development, family and consumer science and community development. Seaman Knapp said it best. Your mission, he said, is to solve the problems of poverty, to increase the measures of happiness, and to harness the forces of all learning to the useful and needful in human society. The questions for our future should be less about the nature of our programs and more about the impact of our projects on the people we serve. The questions then are, are our programs relevant? Do our programs make a difference? Are we communicating in the best possible ways? Is this information changing behavior and results? Is it improving lives? A fifth statement that I know we all hear frequently is the title of my presentation. So why do we need extension anyway? This question comes with a particular sting because it goes to the core of our souls and the labor of our days. It questions our existence and our very reason for being. It is certainly the definitive question. So let me try to answer it. We need extension today because it is a well-rounded program that at a, at a national level provides consistency as well as the pooling of resources and expertise while preserving a local sense of identity and responsiveness which is so darn needed. We need extension today because it is among the most effective mechanisms for individual and social empowerment. Extension was among the first programs to encourage the direct participation of its users in the process of planning, implementation, and assessment of its programs. Yes, extension is about service and outreach, but it is truly about engagement. The vectors of extension do not point just in one direction. Extension provides a two-way street, promoting an exchange that strengthens the skills and the self-confidence of the user as much as the talent, expertise, and knowledge of its providers. 
We need extension today more than ever because our society is growing, not only in size, but also in the nature and complexity of its programs, of its problems. The recent and painful lessons of natural disasters, the threats of man-made catastrophes, of pandemic diseases, and the fragility of the technological systems on which our trust and welfare so confidently reside give us reasons to be concerned. But we also need extension, not only for the times of deprivation and sorrow, but also for those of prosperity and happiness and celebration. People in extension know that the future will always be better if it finds in us the own wavering resolve to learn from each other and to help each other. Plain and simple, we need extension. And we are all called to be agents who transmit the message that a better, healthier, happier world is within our reach. 100 years from now, we will still rely on the individual to individual contact that Seaman Knapp recognized as the most transformative tool for change that humans have at their disposal. There is a structure in Washington, D.C that rich in symbolism commemorates Seaman Knapp. It is not a building with thick walls. It is a bridge. So let's affirm today our commitment to the powerful legacy we have inherited. The land-run university system with its inseparable tripartite mission of teaching, research, and service. Seaman Knapp encouraged us with his words when he said, quote, let us have an education for the masses, one that will fit them to become the great, honest, faithful, intelligent, toiling, thrifty, common people upon which alone great nations are founded. Dear colleagues, I salute all of you for your dedication and for your many extraordinary accomplishments. In closing, I should mention that there is one last statement that I commonly hear, and that is, extension agents are the unsung heroes of this nation and have the best people skills that one can find. And that deserves a round of applause. So as you travel safely back home, please feel certain that we can exalt in celebration for Extension's future. Actually, I guess that what I'm saying is, I hope you have a wonderful life. Thanks for having me.